Section 8 of The Fables of Pilpe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fables of Pilpe by Anonymous. Translated by Abdullah ibn al makafa and Joseph Harris. Section 8 The Leopard and the Lion. In the neighborhood of Basora there was a lovely island in which grew a most delightful wood, where pleasing breezes whispered their love-stories to the rustling leaves. This enchanting forest was watered with several fountains, whence a number of recreating streams ran gently winding to every part of it. In this lovely place there lodged a leopard so furious that even the most daring lion durst not approach within a league of his habitation. For several years his renowned and unequalled courage kept him in peace within this island, with a little leopard that was his favorite and heir to whom, he said one day, "'Son, so soon as thou shalt be strong enough to oppose my enemies, I will resign to thee the care of governing this island, and retire into one corner of it, where I will spend the remainder of my days, without trouble or molestation.' But death crossed the old leopard's design. He died when he least dreamt of it, and the young one, before he expected it, succeeded him. The ancient enemies of the leopard no sooner heard of his death and the weakness of his successor, but they entered into a league, and together invaded the island, and the young leopard, finding himself unable to withstand such a number of enemies, made his escape into the deserts, and there secured himself. In the meantime, his enemies, having together made themselves masters of the island, every one claimed an equal right to the sovereignty, and each would command in chief. Thus they fell out, and the business came to the decision of a bloody battle, wherein the lion, being a victor, drove all the rest of his competitors out of his territories, and became the sole and peaceable master of the island. Some years later, the leopard, having devoted his life to travel, in one of his journeys, meeting an assembled body of lions in a remote part of the forest, recounted to them his misfortunes, and besought them to assist him in the recovery of his just inheritance. But the lions, who knew full well the strength of the usurper, refused their assistance to the leopard, and replied, Poor silly creature, dost thou not understand that thy island is now under the power of a lion so redoubted that the very birds are afraid to fly over his head? We advise thee rather, added they, to go and wait upon him, submissively offer thy services to him, and take some lucky opportunity privately to revenge the injuries he has done thee. The leopard followed this counsel, went to the lion's court, and there introducing himself into the acquaintance of one of the most favorite domestics, by a thousand caresses engaged him to give him an opportunity to discourse with his master. When he had obtained permission, he played his part so well that the lion found him to be a creature of so much merit, that he conferred a very noble employment upon him in his court and in a very little time the leopard so insinuated himself into the lion's favor that the first grandees of the court began to grow jealous of him. But their jealousies were all in vain. The lion found him more valuable than them all, and in spite of all their idle malice, treated him accordingly. It happened some time after this that some extraordinary exigence of state called the way the lion to a place far distant from the island. But the monarch, being now grown lazy, had no mind to stir out of his delightful abode at a time that the heat was so excessive. This, the leopard perceiving, offered to undertake the voyage himself, and after he had obtained leave, departed, arrived at the place, dispatched his business, and returned back to court with such an unexpected speed, that the king, admiring his diligence, said to those about him, This leopard is one whom it is impossible for me sufficiently to reward. He contemns labor, and despises hardship so it be to procure the welfare and peace of my dominions. Having said this, he sent for the leopard, highly applauded his zeal, and in reward of his services gave him the government of all his forests, and made him his heir. Now, vizier, had not the leopard undertaken this journey, he had never regained his island. The minister, now finding that it would be impossible to dissuade the king from the resolution he had taken to travel, said no more to hinder him, and he soon prepared for his journey. During his absence he entrusted those viziers, in whom he had the greatest confidence, with the care of his dominions, and charged them above all things to be kind and loving to the people. After a thousand admonitions of this kind, and a strict care that none but people worthy of their office were left in trust till his return, the glorious Dabshelem, being at ease within himself, and in full peace of mind, set forward with some of his quarters for Serendib, where he at length safely arrived after a long and painful journey. 
When he had given himself the refreshment of a short repose, he began to think of the business of his journey. He spent first, however, three days in walking about and taking a full view of the city. Then, leaving his most cumbersome baggage behind, as also some part of his train, he crossed the mountain, which he found wonderfully high and steep, but environed with a great number of pleasant gardens and lovely meadows. When he had now crossed the mountain and was descending on the other side, he perceived a very obscure den or cavern, which, on his inquiry, the inhabitants of the mountain told him was the retirement of a certain hermit, called Bidpe, that is to say, the friendly physician, and that some of the Indian grandees called him Pilpe, that he was a person of profound knowledge, and had retired from the world in contempt of the hurry and vanity of it, and pleased himself in leading a solitary life. This highly increased Abshalom's curiosity, who therefore went himself to the mouth of the cave, and Pilpe, seeing him approach, went out to meet him, and invited him in. The king being entered, the old Brahmin besought him to rest himself, and begged leave to ask him the reason of his taking so long and dangerous a journey. The king, who had something of a prophetic apprehension that he should meet with what he sought for in his converse with this old man, recounted to him the whole story of his travels, his dream, the discovery of the treasure, and what was contained in the piece of white satin. The Brahmin then, with a look of the highest pleasure, told the king he looked upon those to be a happy people who lived under his reign, and that he could not sufficiently applaud his having contemned the fatigues of a tedious journey, to acquire knowledge for the felicity of his subjects. Then, taking occasion from hence, he opened his lips, like a cabinet of precious knowledge, and charmed Abshalom with his admirable discourses. After several other things, they talked concerning Hoshank's letter. Dabshalem read the admonitions which it contained one after the other. At the end of each, Pilpe gave the fables which served to illustrate them, and the monarch kept them heedfully in his memory. End of section 8